this afternoon's program, I think, as we sort of stay on message. Um, in order to keep that retention rate high uh, throughout the afternoon, we're going to do a little bit of shifting so that we're going to, our goals will be to try to get everybody out and on the road by 4 o'clock. So that's the, okay, reinforcement, okay. Um, so, uh, welcome back. Um, just a little bit of orientation for our next session. In preparation uh, for today's event, a pre-summit on teacher retention was held at William and Mary back in September. Uh, stakeholders concerned with retention joined together to discuss challenges of providing high quality induction and retention strategies for today's teachers, particularly with a focus on new teachers. So today, Dr. Denise Johnson of William & Mary School of Education will present a report on the ideas generated from that work session. Denise. Good afternoon. I'm just glad I'm not last. <laughs> there are some things to be thankful for. So I am very grateful to be here, and um, I, I do want to tell, say that I'm just the messenger. Um, I am, I'm sharing data that I have collected from a couple of different sources, but I also, like all of you, feel very, very passionately about what I do, teaching teachers, um, all that you do in your school divisions, and so I'm, I'm very grateful for that passion and care. And one of the great things about bringing groups of people together, like at the pre-summit, is that you're just in a room full of people who are just as concerned and caring as you are. And it's just, um, you know that there's hope. And there, you know, we'll find a way. Um, I, I think we're all committed to that, right? That's right. You with me? <laughs> all right. Uh, so, um, I know that last year's summit did result in legislation that made it easier to become a teacher. But easier isn't necessarily better. And so it's important that we change, it's critical that we change the conversation to teacher retention. And that's why we're here today. And we're hoping that legislation is a result of this meeting today as well. The pre-summit brought together those across Virginia who are on the ground working every day to, to, uh, to uh, accommodate, to help, to provide, to do all of those things for all of the issues that we've heard all morning from the data that Luke presented to the teacher panel. Um, there are, it's, it is obviously a complex issue with no easy answer. Um, and, when we, and, it, and like I said, it takes all of us. So that the group of people that came together were, are, are they're doing that work. And, and it's, I, I think it's important for us to represent their thoughts about um, what they think are the critical, what our what our critical points are for this legislate for the legis, for the legislator, those who are making um, these decisions. I want to start though with let's see which if I'm going to be able to. There we go. I want to start with a little bit of an overview of the day at the premium. So it's, uh, it was held on September the 26th at William and Mary, and our keynote speaker was Ryan Saunders from the Learning Policy Institute. And they've just put out, and you can see the web address here to get it yourself. This a brand new report looking at nationally the issues around teacher retention. And I want to share just a few slides from his report. So I'm making it clear these are not mine; these are his. That I think are critical for you to understand where the, we were listening to the national report. We did not have Luke's data at the time. I wish we did because I'm sitting there furiously thinking, I just heard that data today just like you did for the first time and thinking about how that goes along with the national data as well as how it goes along uh, with the exit interview data that I'm also going to share in just a little bit. But this, th given this perspective, I wanted you to see where we were coming from in our um, resulting critical points. So he shared, as, as you can see here, that the, the attrition is from teachers who do not stay, not from those who are retiring. And we, ought, we already know that. As Luke pointed out, if, you know, if we had a zero-sum game, it would be great. But that's not the issue. Sixty-six percent are leaving the profession before retirement. So if we could reduce the level of pre-retirement attrition, we could substantially reduce the demand for teachers. But as we know, that's complicated. 
So what are those issues? So again, from the national perspective, from the research that they've done, here's how it lays out. Dissatisfaction due to accountability pressures, testing, working conditions, um, administrative support, family and personal reasons, retirement to pursue another job, and financial reasons. Isn't that interesting that financial reasons are at the bottom? That doesn't mean that they, it isn't critical as we've heard all day, but when you're, you know, you're working in something that you're extremely passionate about, these other things play a huge role. In looking, just as a, as a looking ahead just a little bit from the exit interview data that we, that, um, we gathered, it, it, for the teachers in that pilot study, it falls out just exactly like this, with numbers very, very close to this. So retirement it does not constitute the main reason why we're losing teachers. So what really matters then? And the Learning Policy Institute in their research says, well, competitive compensation matters, and we all know that. Effective training and preparation matters. Support for new teachers matters and then teaching conditions, including administrative support, is really matters. And I think that all of those we heard today, it's hard to, to not think about um, the, all the wonderful teachers that were on this panel today and, and the things you were hearing from them, they fall directly into these categories. Compensation, as we heard again from the, the teachers, uh, teachers make 20% less than other college graduates and 30% by mid-career. Take a look at this next bullet. In the room at the pre-summit, when Ryan Saunders read this, there was a literal gasp from the people in the room. In more than 30 states, a mid-career teacher heading a family of four is eligible for government assistance. We have to do something about that. The next um, on the list was insufficient preparation and mentoring. One in four teachers of color enter through alternate certification pathways, and alternate certification is associated with 25% higher turnover rates. And that, without having the data at the time, that is exactly the data that Luke presented this morning. 65% of our teachers are finding alternate routes into teaching. So the alternate route means less coursework, often it, no student teaching, if any, um, before becoming responsible for their own classroom. So not only is this a recruitment and retention issue, but it's also a quality of teaching issue. Under preparation and mentoring, preparation and early mentoring is strongly influences teachers' effectiveness and retention. So you know that teachers are, um, if they're taking a traditional route, they're going into considerable debt to do so, um, about two-thirds of the teachers who receive comprehensive preparation before entering, only about two-thirds, so that's a little bit higher than what we saw for Virginia, and then fewer teachers receive mentoring. Now, this is statewide or um, nationwide. We know that in the state of Virginia, there is um, mentoring is required for the first year of teaching, and it is somewhat funded. I was waiting. <laughs> Administrative support, as we saw earlier from Luke's data, is also extremely important. Signi there is a significant relationship between administrative support and teacher turnover. When teachers feel strongly that their administration isn't supportive, they are more than twice as likely to leave teaching. In the pilot study where that I'm going to uh, data I'm going to present later, 32% of teachers left because of liter uh, indicated that administrative por support or lack of was one reason why they were leaving. For teachers who were in who were leaving after only five or fewer years in teaching, that increased to 41%. Support includes nurturing collaboration, acknowledging teachers' accomplishments, providing useful feedback, and offering tailored professional development. And we heard that today from the, our teacher panel. So 
So effective training and support for new teachers includes some of these uh, that have also been mentioned today, um, grow your own programs, teacher residencies, and then of course mentoring and ongoing support. First year teachers who receive induction support are twice as likely to stay in teaching. This is especially important for our alternate route teachers. High quality induction includes mentors from the same field, common planning time and uh, um, with other teachers in the same subject, regularly scheduled collaboration and an external network. Additional elements um, that, are, that, that also are included here is uh, participating in seminars for beginning teachers and a reduced number of course preps. So this is the national, and I would say also we're very reflective of Virginia data on what matters in teacher retention. Now I'm gonna share with you information from the exit interview that reflects um, Virginia data, and it gives some quant qualitative backup to some of the quali uh, quantitative data that Luke presented earlier. So the, in 2017, the General Assembly passed Senate Bill 360 requiring the VDOE to develop and oversee a pilot program to administer the model exit questionnaire or interview. Um, it required five demographically and regionally, regionally diverse school divisions to volunteer to participate, and then William and Mary volunteered to administer and analyze the data. 212 respondents um, were collected, responses were collected by the end of the, um, the, ac of the academic year. The five school divisions were Chesapeake, Fairfax, Pocosin, Salem City, and Washington County. Thank you to those school divisions. The, the exit interview was created, the model exit interview was created by a group of stakeholders convened by the VDOE. And it is available online if you're interested. Um, there's, there in, um, in collecting and analyzing the data, there's a, a little bit of a flaw, I think, with the, with the interview in that, as you'll see, um, when we get into the aspects of the interview, um, when you get into the school climate, reasons for leaving teaching, and incentives to remain, you can click as many of the um, answers as you felt were appropriate. So you can't look at any one piece of data and say, oh, this is the number one reason that teachers are leaving or how they felt about uh, their school climate or different things like that because they could rank them um, as many as, as they felt appropriate. Demographically, the majority of respondents were white, female, 50 years or older, who taught elementary and held a master's degree. So very much similar to the data that we, we heard earlier. Um, the next part of this interview was school climate. And I just am gonna apologize in advance for all the text. It would have been better if I'd have had some lovely charts up here. So, um, sorry about that. So the majority of respondents held up, had a positive uh, view of, their, of the school divisions. 80% of the teachers in the interview uh, said that they, they would, they, it, their uh, school was either working conditions in their school division were either very good or good. And that's great news. You know, we are, we're providing good places for teachers to work. Those teachers who had been in the Teach, had been teaching five or fewer years, held more negative views of their divisions than others. There, uh, all the way through the, there were different times in the interview where there were opportunities for people to give written feedback. Um, so there were 151 people who also gave qualitative responses to why, uh, uh, that they could add about why they left. So in just looking uh, qualitatively and doing a quick qualitative analysis, their uh, school administration was cited as a reason for both positive and negative experiences. They, positive were examples were availability of professional development and resources, negative were workload, testing, and, um, and interactions with human resources. So one of the, the, 
at the pre-summit, uh, most of the people, a lot of the people there were in human resources and they were just really happy about that one. Um, one, of the, one of the good things about an anonymous interview, because this was sent to people anon uh, as a link and they responded anonymously. So the school divisions who participated did not get back specific data to their division and they knew that going in. And all of them weren't happy about that either and I can understand that. Um, but the flip side of that is doing something anonymously, then you're, you're going to get some honest feedback. And people were very honest. And they gave lots of you know, responses to in a way that you would not get if the teacher exiting thought that their school division was going to know what they, what they said. And that just makes sense. So now, under the category of reasons for leaving, there were quite a few categories. There were personal reasons, benefits reasons, professional reasons, learning climate, leadership and support, school and community, and teacher preparation. Those were all the different categories under reasons for leaving that the interview asked for information. So a personal reasons for leaving, 43% of the teachers, of the 212 teachers who responded were retiring. 38% of those not retiring indicated family relocation as the reason why they were leaving. This, and I, if I didn't already tell you, this, uh, the exit interview data is available on the VDOE website and so is the interview. So you can, I'm not going to go through every single piece, you would not want me to go through every single piece of this data, but if you're more, in, if you're interested in digging deeper into some of these responses, then the, uh, the report is on, online and available. So the 43% retiring were both full benefits and partial benefits. Under benefits reasons, um, there were six different categories that they, that they could choose from here. Again, they could choose any of them. 25% of all said salary was the reason, uh, was a benefit for why they were leaving. 20% for teachers who had taught five or fewer years. Under professional reasons, there were 13 different categories that they could choose from under professional. 16% said that their job description and responsibilities were a reason they were leaving. 24% of those not retiring um, took a position in another division. 30% of those teaching five or fewer years took a position in another division. Under learning climate, there were six different categories they could choose from which they could choose. 34% of all said workload and 25% school culture and climate played a role in their decision to leave. Of the teachers teaching five or fewer years, 41% indicated that school culture and climate was a reason why they were leaving. Leadership and support, six categories there. Um, lack of support from administration was 29% of all respondents and 26% poor communication between administration and teachers. Five or fewer, teachers teaching five or fewer years were much more likely to indicate lack of support from administration and poor communication between administration and teachers. Under school and community, there were four responses there. 29% um, felt a lack of support from their school administration. Oops, sorry. Just read that one. Nine percent of lack of all support from parents and community. Five teachers teaching five or fewer years much, were much more likely to feel unaccepted by faculty and or community. And we did hear a little bit of that today on the panel. It's hard to find sometimes other teachers to talk specifically about your needs and the things that you're dealing with. For teacher preparation, this was not differentiated by what route you took, so it's just teacher preparation with four responses, and no, response, no respondents indicated that they had inadequate preparation. Uh, there was a small percentage of teachers teaching five or fewer years that felt inadequate preparation in classroom management. Not a surprise. The last category was incentive to remain. There were 15 categories that they could choose from what reasons would there be for you to stay? What could, you, what could we do to keep you here? Number one was yeah, 
give me a pay increase, <laughs> that would help, right? Not a shocker. But this one might be. 23% indicated that there was nothing that you could do to keep them in education. Teachers with five or fewer years were much more likely to indicate that a different school administrator and fewer discipline problems would have been incentives to remain. So that is the, the, the highlights from the exit interview um, that I do think adds some data to, qual qualitative data to the, uh, the data that Luke um, presented to us. Now, <clears throat> the, so at the pre-summit, we heard from Ryan Saunders from the Learning Policy Institute and teach, uh, the, uh, the attendees there were grouped in division-like sized at tables. So they were able to talk to other people in divisions with similar size as them. If you were an attendee at the pre-summit, would you raise your hand? Because there's a, quite a few of you are supposed to be here and hold me honest today, right? So if you have anything to add to anything that I'm saying, please, please feel free to do so. Um, but the, um, that provided them an opportunity to talk about similar issues that, that, that they might be having. Um, so after Ryan gave his presentation, we had an opportunity for people to get together and discuss and write down key critical points. Then in the afternoon, we had a superintendent's panel that was, um, was presented by Dr. Kim Huff from Loudoun, Dr. Eric Jones from Powhatan, Dr. Rosa At Atkins from Charlottesville City, and Dr. Melinda Boone from Norfolk. Um, so a variety of division sizes and um, diversity there that was fantastic. And they talked about all some really great strategies they were using in their divisions in efforts for teacher retention. And then the groups got to break out and talk with a panel member. And then we had another opportunity to collect what they felt critical issue, the critical issues would be for today's meeting to bring forward. So the, um, so uh, we gathered the, all that data and put it together. And I wanted to give you a little bit of 125 people attended. Um, I thought this was interesting. 60 school divisions um, from all, reg all eight regions were there. Um, there were 31 different position titles. So the people in the room were the people who are, on, like I said, on the ground working with teacher retention um, issues. And sometimes that is HR. So 48 people in the room worked in HR. Interestingly, there are all kinds of different titles for HR people. So there's an executive director or a director or a talent Direct development person or an administrator or a teacher, ed, and licensure person. Um, there, are, there are all, I think that that's just interesting that the divisions have lots of different people and depending on the division size of wor working in teacher retention issues. But in some divisions, some small divisions, that's the assistant superintendent or the superintendent who's doing that work. So that, you know, that's, an, that's important to think about too. Who, who is responsible for doing this work? Coming in, when they registered, when people registered to attend the summit, um, we, I asked them different questions about what they thought were coming in, what they thought the teacher retention issues were in their divisions. And here were, um, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. I asked them what their responsibilities were and then what they thought the issues were. So here were the number one, number two, and number three responsibilities of the 125 people in the room. Mentoring and coaching new teachers, hiring new teachers and recruitment, and new teacher induction. Then here were the top three issues before coming to the meeting that they thought were, would rise, um, that were important. They wanted to talk to other people in other divisions on what they do to support retention. They wanted to, uh, they felt that new teacher induction, training, mentoring, strategies and ideas were critical, and then challenges in keeping teachers, such as stress, pay, testing, underpreparedness, feeling undervalued, and were all issues. And then after collecting all the issues, tallying them up, laying them out, the number one issue that came through was funding funding for mentor compensation, for additional years of induction and mentoring, for incentives, which we're gonna talk more about in just a minute, to enhance mentor programs, for lease time for mentors and mentees to work together. 
Number two, state level support for mentoring programs. Revisit and update state mentoring guidelines, which were released in 2000. Provide state facilitated mentor training that could be consistent for all divisions and recommend or provide effective teacher mentoring programs. So the, the mentoring programs in the state is just as different as each division in the state, right? Number three were incentives linked to recruitment and retention, provide tuition reimbursement, facilitate loan forgiveness programs, and incentivize working in hard to staff schools, all of which we've heard, heard today. And then finally, critical issue number four was licensure. The praxis is more of a barrier than a support. Revisit and revamp reciprocity and enhance partnerships between the states and divisions and teacher preparation programs. So this, these were the four critical issues. Now, interesting, you might say that one of them wasn't increased teacher salary. And I think that the, that is because I feel, I feel like they assume that that was on the table. That's a given, that that's what we were going to try to do, uh, that, that of course, that would be the thing that we would do. And then, as soon as we do that, uh, we need to start providing support for these teachers in the classroom through mentoring and making, make, boosting and building those programs and getting support for teachers. And we heard that today. I think that that's critically important. So this is all I have. And I don't know um, if we want to stop or time for questions. Surpri are there any surprises here? Anything that you thought, that's interesting. Um, I can talk for hours about teacher What are the things that I would think about when you're talking about the teacher salary policy and 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 the teacher salary so that's, the, so that's what I mean by, you know, in the future, if something like this were to continue, if they were continue to be used, the exit interview, then maybe making that so that you had, you had to order or
Because of retiring, you can't. There was no way to do to divide that out. There was no. It, because you could click. In, you, you're, yeah, but, so, but they could have clicked nothing and a pay increase, because that's the way the teacher exit the interview is set up. It's okay. it was multi cat. You could click in, all that apply yeah. to you. Yeah. Well, you saw there were how many people? What was the percentage? Two hundred twelve. Oh, sorry, but what was the percentage of folks who said retiring? 40, it's 43. So it could be that those 23% happen to all be those retirees. And I'm sorry, uh, Dean Pianta, but when I'm ready to retire, I'm out. Um, you know, that, that, right. you know, that, yeah, that could so, be one of those. I mean, that, so be, knowing what that is for people who we would think would stay, would be, that would be really telling. It, it would. It would. Um, and I, and I think that, again, they're depending, and, and I think Dr. Lane maybe could speak to this, if people have questions about continuing the, the use of the model teacher exit interview, it, it does need to be revised a little bit for it to give us more information. For example, um, wouldn't you like to know more about what administrative support would have made a difference? You know, it just there was just administrative support, but what pieces of it? You know, so so there's lots of things that we could do there to make the data that you get back more powerful. Um, so I'm not sure how that's going to play out moving forward. Thanks. I'm sorry, I've done a lot of reflecting in the last month since we had that um, conference. And I think it's important to, to note that the guidelines are 18 years old. That's a generation. And our generation, the, the, the teachers we're getting now, um, fresh out of college, are of a different generation and have different expectations. So their induction, their mentoring, their easing into our profession has to be different than it was 18 years ago. Uh, it, it does. What well, the amount know. of information we have available now on that is we, we have two decades more data, right? <laughs> and I have, I have new teachers who come with their parents. I, I mean, that, I'm not kidding. They, they do. I, I, I'm not joking. And it's, it is a, just a different mindset. And this generation doesn't stay in one profession or one job, especially, for very long. So we have to really really focus on how on we get the them to, to develop an identity as a teacher. Yes. And I think that that's really why you saw the critical points come out really being about teacher support and, and funding the, those mentor programs and everything is because of the, the critical nature that, that that takes. We do see, I know at William & Mary, our students are very passionate about being teachers. It's a social justice issue for them. They want to be in those um, high needs schools um, and, and but they need support. You know, they, we, when there's no teacher preparation program that can fully prepare any teacher to walk straight into the classroom and be ready to go. That ongoing support needs to be there. Um, and so I think that that group really, especially the pre-summit attendees, really recognize that. And just as an aside, just a, um, I did a little bit of evaluating on the back end of the summit, and this group of people really want to stay together. They want to continue to meet. They want to continue to share resources. They want to continue sharing and changing ideas. And I think that that is one way to meet the complex needs of, of all that we have to do, is to work together in ways that we might not have by ourselves, but we could have if we work more broadly together. Thank you. Well, if I could have all of the panelists for our next policy session, please come on to the stage. We'll do introductions once everybody's up here.
Well, again, Dr. Johnson, thank you. That was incredibly informative. I know that uh, in a lot of ways it was affirming of what we heard from our teachers earlier today and certainly what, we, what we've all heard from, from the research. And uh, to answer the question that was posed, certainly the VDOE is looking at ways to continue the exit questionnaire and to expand it. Uh, but we're also working on a uh, new legislative requirement for a teacher working condition survey and, and the funding necessary to be able to, to do that. So we're, these are definitely research questions we're continuing to seek uh, while, while trying to move uh, the policy landscape forward. This panel will talk about and analyze the policy landscape based on what you've heard today. Um, contributing to the conversation today, uh, I'd like to first introduce the Honorable Glenn Davis, Jr. Uh, please, yes. Uh, also, the Honorable Cheryl Turpin, both from the House of Delegates. Dan Gecker, President of the Board of Education. Jim Livingston, President of the Virginia Education Association. Uh, Douglas Fulton, President of the Virginia Association of Secondary School Principals. And Dr. Jeff Smith, President of the Virginia Association of School Superintendents. Uh, I've, I've prepared uh, one question for each of the panelists, and I, I believe that you each have a copy. We're not going to necessarily go in the order that's on there. Uh, but uh, we heard earlier today heartbreaking stories about teacher compensation, workload, stress, class size, increased mandates, lack of autonomy, needs for reciprocity, facilities issues, pension issues, the need for culturally relevant professional development and wraparound services for our students, and, and, and a, 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 a need to reduce focus on testing so that we can engage students truly in learning. And so, uh, this is the group that in a lot of ways advocates for, has the responsibility to uh, generate a lot of the policy that, that uh, governs our public schools. And so I, I thought we would start first with the big topic that we've heard today. And, and again, we all heard those uh, uh, difficult stories about teacher compensation, the impact that it's, that it's had. So <coughs> Delegate Davis, we're gonna start with you. Having heard that significant impact and, and the need for our teachers to, to uh, be able to take care of their families while they're taking care of our students. How does the General Assembly think about compensation and what, what, are, what are some of the goals in the General Assembly to uh, improve compensation uh, potentially to the national average? Well, I, I, so a lot of this I can only speak for myself, but I think there's a general consensus that teacher, the teacher profession is probably one of the, if not the most important uh, profession we've got in the Commonwealth of Virginia. It really does set the landscape for uh, our nation in the future by you know, making sure this upcoming generation is, are prepared for what they're gonna face uh, later on in life. And we have to focus on three things. We have to focus on how do we welcome and, in, in, and uh, engage and encourage new people to become teachers, to be that next generation of teachers. And what do we have to do from a compensation standpoint, both salary and benefits to make that happen? The second thing we have to do is how do we retain good and great teachers to be mentors for those new teachers coming in. It doesn't make sense to retrain a workforce over and over again. And honestly, only those that have done it for 15, 20 years are the best mentors for those coming in. They've been there, they know what to expect. They can share what works and what doesn't work. And the third thing is we have to recognize that the teacher in the classroom needs to be focused on the students in front of them at all times. They, we gotta make sure our teachers aren't worried about, honestly, what many of us would be if we were on government subsidy. We all saw that slide on what percent of our teachers are on government programs. Well, it, it's understandable then if the teacher in the classroom is worried about how they're gonna pay their mortgage, how they're gonna feed their family, you know, how they can get little Johnny to the doctor's appointments that he needs. If the teachers are thinking about that, they're not completely focused, they're not able to work to their full extent on making sure our students are the best and brightest that they can be. So we need to make sure that our teachers are, have a compensation package that allows them to do what they do best and to reach that full potential for the students. And I think those are the three things we have to concentrate on. Where that comes inside of compensation is, unfortunately, it's not simple, it's very complex because each of those require talking about different levels of compensation at different impacts. But we need to address the starting salary of teachers. We need to address the funding for things like mentoring and other things that were up here. And then we need to address how do we keep and retain teachers when they really are kind of being um, uh, recruited away from the teaching profession because of the expertise that they have. 
And all three segments, I think, need a, uh, a very comprehensive discussion so we can address them all. Thank you, Delegate Davis. I, I know that uh, compensation is certainly a huge priority for, for all educators, and, and, and all of us are looking to the, the General Assembly to, uh, to how we can resolve these issues for our teachers. Uh, Delegate Turpin, I'm now going to turn to you. And uh, in, the, in the last presentation, we heard a great deal about the importance of in, uh, induction and mentoring programs in, in retaining our teachers. Uh, so uh, tell us a little bit about some of the policies that we can move forward to support mentoring programs uh, and, and uh, to support teacher retention through induction. Well, first of all, thank you for letting me be here. More importantly, everybody out there needs to know my number one job is high school science teacher. I had to take a day off today to be here as a part-time legislator. Mm -hmm. So. So truly, everything that all the teachers were speaking about earlier were all the exact same things that I have experienced in my life, brought me to tears. I was like getting a little choked up there. But you know, I'm here to fight on your behalf. So in response to um, mentoring programs, I think you've got to find your um, veteran teachers. I've been teaching so long, I taught before SOLs. You know, that's, there aren't very many of us left out there who can say that, but I've been doing this a long time. Um, find those veteran teachers, find those mentored teachers. Um, usually they're the ones that the other teachers would nominate. They would say, I would like to nominate this person as a teacher. So if we're talking about site base, let the, the, in a science department, let the science department select who they believe are your mentored teachers. Um, we've got to give mentored teachers stipends. You've got to give them all teachers need more money, but you know, if you're going to be that go-to teacher, let them be the go-to teacher, give them a stipend, give them a block off so they can help develop and do things for the people they're mentoring. There are many, many pieces we can do. Thank you so much. Uh, Jim, the next question is for you. Uh, as, as the representative and advocate, advocate uh, for the leading teacher organization in the Commonwealth, what policies or legislation is VEA promoting with a focus on teacher retention? Thank you, Dr. Lane. Before, what about that panel of educators that we heard from earlier? They just were a huge <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, there are, uh, this is not an easy issue to solve. We didn't get where we are overnight and we're not going to emerge from where we are overnight. But I think there are some critical things that we can address, that we must address. Um, the Virginia Education Association uh, has a very robust um, legislative agenda this year, dealing with a myriad of the issues, most of which were contained in the panel uh, discussion earlier. Um, we intend to initiate legislation that is going to use a teacher evaluation model with multiple measures, which reduces the reliance on standardized testing. SOL tests were not designed to measure teacher effectiveness, period. And we do a disservice not only to our teachers, but to our students when we use them in a, in a, a manner in which they were not designed. Uh, we are going to uh, initiate legislation which will um, implement and fully fund a statewide, reliable, nationally validated school personnel climate survey. You know, we talked to some about the exit survey, which is important. Thank you, Delegate Turpin, for uh, your legislation last year regarding You're an welcome. exit survey. And while an exit survey is important, the reality is we also need to know what's going on in the moment, what's going on in our classrooms and our school buildings and so forth during the course of the year. Not in an attempt to point a finger at a, a person or a school division, but rather to improve working conditions because we all know that our uh, working conditions are our uh, students' learning conditions. We need to reinstate uh, state funding dedicated to capital improvements. We heard a great deal from our panel this morning about capital improvement issues. 170-year-old school building. Although my last building was not that old, I have taught in buildings in my career uh, that, are, that are that age. And, and, and I think what we need to keep in mind with regard to that issue is there is nothing more telling to a student or an employee when they have to walk into a dilapidated building day in and day out that speaks to 
how they perceive they are or are not being valued. Um, we all deserve a, a working environment that is safe and uh, comfortable. Uh, we, um, here, here's a huge one, and I think this goes, and I know that some superintendents and some principals in the audience are going to cringe, but the VEA will introduce legislation this year to require a duty-free lunch for all certificated personnel. Uh, believe it or not, for those of you who may not know, that is not currently in code. And there are too many instances where we have teachers who go an entire day with nothing to eat because they had to cover a class, monitor the cafeteria, or, or uh, something of that nature. We also intend to uh, introduce legislation to expand the Virginia Retirement System membership to include part-time teachers. We have, for a variety of reasons, an increasing number of individuals who um, choose not to work full-time, but would, would choose to work part-time uh, if they um, had uh, appropriate benefits. Uh, we also are going to support legislation which fully funds the revised standards of quality. You're welcome, Dr. Decker. Um, of, of, of the SOQs <laughs> as adopted by the Virginia Board of Education to accurately reflect what it costs to educate Virginia students and support their mental health needs. The General Assembly currently funds, fully funds the SOQs. What they do not fund, however, are the revisions that the Board of Ed has adopted for the SOQs. It's time we fund our schools now, and this is the way to do it. Um, we uh, also uh, intend to support legislation um, to increase funds directed towards Virginia's most at-risk students. Virginia currently provides uh, less than 20% uh, funding for at-risk students. The national average is somewhere in the range of 26%, um, and, and that's just simply not acceptable. Uh, we also intend to support legislation that, will, that uh, supports the needs and addresses inequities in Virginia's small and rural school divisions. And one of the things I like to share with people, I think too many people misinterpret inequities does not mean equal. Let that sink in for a moment. Students with higher needs, with greater needs, deserve greater support. And we need to be able to provide that. Um, we need to um, be sure that we are uh, improving and funding programs and staffing to counteract student behaviors that lead to suspensions and expulsions. It's time that we eliminate the artificially created support staff cap that was instituted in 2008 um, to balance the state budget, quite frankly. Um, I uh, personally, and as president of the Virginia Education Association, find it reprehensible that we literally balance the state budget on the backs of our children. And um, those are just a few of the um, items that we will be either initiating or supporting. And I would simply echo what my colleagues on the first panel had to say. Um, you know, there are a lot of things that we can do that we need to do. Uh, and we can begin by recognizing the fact that we have woefully underfunded public schools in the Commonwealth of Virginia for far too long. Thanks, Jim. <laughs> Jim, thanks for your uh, tangible ideas and, and uh, continued advocacy for educators. Uh, now I'm going to turn to the, uh, Mr. Gecker, our president of the Board of Ed. Uh, Mr. Gecker, is the board focused on teacher shortages and retention, and how can the state board have an impact here? Uh, the short answer, of course, is yes, we are focused on it. I will say that after Jim spoke, there's not much else for me to say. The, um, you know, we are, just so everybody understands our role <coughs> constitutionally, we are supposedly the primary policy-making body for education, excuse me, in the Commonwealth. We are subject to the ultimate authority of the General Assembly. Um, in an effort to really regain status as a policy-making body, last year we 
uh, actually put together a comprehensive work plan. We're required to do one, but this one we took a little bit more seriously and decided what topics were of importance going forward in the Commonwealth that we could do deep dives into instead of the typical shallow laundry list of items that uh, cost the state. You know, be, because let's face it, you know, from what you've heard here today, not everything is going to get done at the same time. Sooner or later, somebody, somebody's going to have to prioritize. And the three areas that we talked about, uh, and you know, I recommend reading at least the first 12 pages of our comp plan, uh, because I think it's a good indicator of where we think the Commonwealth needs to go. The first is the equity side. Uh, you know, as Jim just said, students with greater needs deserve greater support. Uh, that is a firm belief of our board. Uh, we have formed a subcommittee of the board called the Evidence-Based Policy Committee. That committee is due to have recommendations out actually in November. We expect the results of those recommendations to be moved to our standing committee on SOQs. And my expectation is that eventually the board will recommend SOQs that have uh, disparate funding. That is, not every child is treated the same in the SOQ funding formula. This is different from an LCI change, by the way, which is, of course, politically very difficult mm -hmm. uh, to discuss. The SOQ change, uh, to the extent I think it will come down, and I don't know what the factors will be yet, will provide our recommendation to the General Assembly for uh, a change in the overall concept of uh, how to fund and to achieve equitable results. The second item on our list, and there are only three of them, is teacher and building leadership. A piece of that is how to entice more teachers, more individuals to come into the teaching profession. A piece of it is how do we retain, and a third part of that is uh, how do we create a building climate so that people want to stay. And so we're going to focus not only on uh, the teaching profession, but also on principals. I will tell you that not a lot of work on our side has been done there yet. We have been focused on uh, the equity piece first, uh, however, uh, I think we can all, I can speak for the board, you know, I will, as a matter of philosophy, I don't speak publicly about where the board is going unless I've got a pretty good idea about the consensus. I don't speak for myself at these meetings. I think it's clear that all of us believe that an increase in compensation is necessary in order to attract and retain teachers in the Commonwealth. <laughs> You know, in my prior life, as a, in my prior political life, I was on the Board of Supervisors in Chesterfield and have a decent idea about how school budgeting works and how local governments treat this. I, I can tell you that over time, uh, what we have seen is, of course, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, government employees generally, when we separate out teachers, were willing to accept work at a lower current salary because of the greater benefits they had both in retirement and current benefits such as health, et cetera, and frankly, job security. <coughs> what we have seen come out of the recession, you know, what was referred to before as the Great Recession, is obviously not a significant increase in salary, if any, a complete reduction of pension benefits and a complete reduction of current benefits. And so it, it's fairly clear, I th as I said, to all members of our board that something's got to give uh, with regard to the compensation piece. The third, I won't go into as, as in any length, but we believe strongly that the uh, standards of uh, accountability or accreditation, excuse me, that is the use of SOL uh, tests as a measure for standards of accreditation uh, has created more harm than good recently. I'm not going to talk to... <laughs> I will say this, and I sat down with Kirk Schroeder, who was president of the Board of Ed when they came in. The logic model for uh, the SOLs, as they're referred to, but really the assessments to be used as an accreditation, was actually fairly solid. Uh, I mean, what they believed would happen was that we would highlight those schools that weren't performing well, and we would put resources into bringing those schools up. In practice, what happened, of course, is the same schools that were doing poorly 20 years ago are, by and large, the same schools doing poorly now. And you, you can't justify the system uh, continuing on that basis. And so that is a topic that the board will discuss. In terms of specific uh, policies, you know, we are and have tried to implement the use of performance-based assessments as opposed to SOL tests at the end of the semester. We lost that one in the legislature this year. Uh, 
if, if you look at the budget bill, there's language that prohibits the use of performance-based assessments in areas that we believed it was appropriate. Uh, as Jim mentioned, uh, we have recommended in uh, 2016, I guess, our recommended list for SO2 changes to the assembly was the full-time principal. I'm not going to read the whole list, but the important ones from today's discussion are, you know, one school counselor for every 250 students, uh, one full-time school psychologist for every 1,000 students, one full-time social worker for every 1,000 stu students, one full-time nurse for every 550 students. Obviously, those recommendations have not been taken. In addition, the board recommended eliminating the support cap that Jim referenced also. Uh, you know, unfortunately, God did not grant me the serenity to accept those things I cannot change. <laughs> <laughs> It, it, it is the curse of my life, and <laughs> although our board does not have ultimate responsibility, as I said, constitutionally, it's clear that the ultimate authority uh, lies with the General Assembly. Uh, it is my hope that our board will continue to advocate for the changes that we believe just for the children of the Commonwealth. Thank you, Dan. Uh, thank you, Dan. And I, I, as, as someone that's gotten to work very closely with uh, President Gecker over the past few months, it's, uh, his words truly are reflective of the passion the board shows for the kids in the Commonwealth. So thank you for continuing to advocate. Uh, next uh, up, I Doug, I want to ask you the next question. Uh, yeah. We heard today about the impact of principals and administrative support on teacher retention. So how can we support our principals to better support our teachers? Thank you, good afternoon. Um, I'm gonna speak to you not only as a, a high school principal and a representative of principals across the Commonwealth, but also as a classroom teacher, which I was for 20 years, and the spouse of an elementary classroom teacher. Um, we are all educators. At one point, I was also working two jobs when I wasn't coaching. I went from teaching teenagers to going to a juvenile detention center and working at nights too, and that might be your definition of insanity, but I understand that's what some of the things you have to do um, to support an income and live, um, live in Northern Virginia on teacher salaries. Uh, principals want to keep good teachers. Uh, you don't win the ball game unless you have great players all the time. And principals, we understand that piece that we want great teachers and we want effective teachers in the classroom. Um, if you look at the most important um, variable in the success of a student is the teacher and the most important variable in school culture is that school leadership and that school administration. Um, there has to be enough support and training for principals when they go into those positions. We see in some states the change in school leadership happening every three years. And we know that can be a negative impact not only on um, teacher development but also student growth. Um, you know, I agree with the ideas of differentiated pay but we focus so much on STEM, um, we should change the narrative. We don't focus on our own profession. We don't put a value in what we do as educators. Um, we should, if we wanna say that STEM teachers should get paid more, I would argue that classroom teachers in K through five should get paid the most because if they're not doing their job, you'll never get to STEM. <laughs> So as part of this, when we have this discussion, I want to make sure that you know we, we're, there's a lot of voices in here when we talk about what is value in education and what we when we see that growth. Uh, you know, uh, even in states with high accountability measures and teacher evaluation systems, they found out fewer teachers have unsatisfactory uh, ratings than before those systems. Um, principals do not want to lose good teachers; they want to keep them in the classroom. We also know that teachers in their first five years are more likely to be put in tough teaching situations. They're more likely to be in those classrooms that other teachers don't want to be in. Um, they're more likely to deal with challenging environments and we need to find support for those. We need to have encouragement and maybe pay differential, uh, differentiation so we can put a veteran teacher in an Algebra one class in high school or in a tough and challenging elementary um, special education classroom so that they're gonna work with those students because that growth is so important. And I agree that we, sh um, we should and, and we don't. And by state um, code, we do not have to use a standardized test for our, our evaluation system for teachers because we should allow teachers who are put in challenging em environments to find their own measurement of what those student success, success and growth is and not just be tied to a state accountability measure because we can't discourage our most effective teachers 
being with our most needy students. And I think that's part of the um, part of the culture that we have right now in the Commonwealth. And I know from principals that are in uh, high uh, poverty areas or in rural areas, they feel like they do the first three to five years of training for the teacher, and then they lose the teacher to a, a division that pays more. So uh, from a state perspective, we would like to have an ability to pay, um, pay teachers to stay in areas that are gonna be in more need um, to provide that support for principals and to keep those administrators in those buildings too. Uh, we often find that administrators that have, principals that have success often move quickly up to the central office. And I think as school divisions, we have to rethink that. We wanna keep those effective principals in the building so we can keep effective teachers in the classroom. So that professional development we like to see statewide for our, our school administrators, we think would be beneficial in supporting teachers. And, and you know, after the recession, we've lost a lot of professional development money. And that PD money is not only valuable for principals, but it's also valuable for sending your teachers elsewhere to making those connections, to going to uh, state and, and national conferences where they can bring back those engaging and new ideas that they wanna work with their students. So uh, when we look at some of these ways that we wanna provide funding, I hope we also look at that professional development funding to support effective teaching, but also effective school leadership. Thank you. Dr. Smith, uh, you work most closely with our HR departments that are responsible for recruiting our teachers and training our principals and the such. Um, and, and I would imagine that the shortage issues that you're facing are not just with teachers, instructional assistants, bus drivers, uh, across the spectrum of the school division, the superintendent's thinking about all shortage areas. How can the Commonwealth support efforts at the division level? Sure, sure. Well, thanks for that question. And I think we are certainly in agreement uh, with a lot of uh, comments that have been made. And let me just share that, uh, you know, early in life I, I learned that, you know, we lose some of what we go after some of the time, but we will lose all of what we choose or decide to not go after all of the time. And so I think that there are some things uh, on, on our end that uh, I hear as a superintendent, and I know that colleagues uh, hear on a regular basis, and we heard that today. In particular, we heard the conversation from experts who are in the classroom on a daily basis working with our young people, that competitive compensation is an absolute must, and that we should go after competitive compensation in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And so we heard that, and uh, I have heard that as superintendent. My colleagues have heard that from uh, teachers and individuals uh, in their school divisions as well. You know, it's, uh, it's, it is a sad day when we hear teachers say that they cannot afford to live in the communities or towns or cities in which they work. And so competitive compensation uh, is an area of focus and need uh, for us. But I think on the other hand, uh, in addition to that, I think we have to keep before us that uh, when we talk about uh, teacher retention and the shortage thereof, that we have young people, that they are young people who stand with those numbers. And uh, we can't forget that we have the young people who are missing out uh, in those classrooms uh, that we are not able uh, to fill in terms of classroom vacancies uh, with uh, teacher positions. And so in our region alone, we, we sent out information and just asked uh, superintendents to respond uh, and, and, and discovered that of uh, the 15 school divisions in our region too, um, eight of the, of the school divisions responded to just a quick survey that we sent out and, uh, and asked a simple question about um, how many vacancies that you have on the first day of school when you open. And then when you just calculate that and look at the number of young people who were missing out, um, we, we just, just based upon the individuals who responded um, we had over um, 6,000 young people who were impacted by the lack of um, having really uh, the teachers in the classrooms. <coughs> and so that's important uh, to keep before us. So I think the competitive compensation is important. But I think the other piece that I have heard as superintendent, and I know my colleagues have heard it as well, and that is uh, greater and more autonomy within the classroom uh, so that teachers can teach and uh, young people can indeed learn, allow teachers to do what they've been trained to do. Uh, and so we heard that today over and over again, and that's very important. I have heard that as superintendent as well, and I know my colleagues uh, have heard that. But I think also another area in terms of the Commonwealth of Virginia where uh, we need some help and assistance, and that's when we look at um, the licensure program. And, 
and we heard that today as well. Uh, greater flexibility in converting the, um, the provisional license uh, to that of the collegiate uh, license uh, in the teaching profession and to look and to really examine other on-ramps while still protecting the integrity of the licensure program. But I think we have to recognize that uh, there are other on-ramps uh, that we should consider. And so we need greater flexibility uh, there as well. And then I think uh, another area uh, for us uh, in terms of um, assistance in that uh, we have heard, and, and, and as we look at the fact of teacher retention with mentorship programs, really to make certain that we're strategic and that there's a gradual release, uh, so to really have the resources to have a robust uh, teacher mentorship program, um, something that we can really support um, within three to five years in terms of teachers uh, with, with us uh, for the first term, or to go to the fifth year if we need to have a gradual release there. So I think that's important. The final thing that I will say that we need support from in terms of the Commonwealth, um, and that's the wraparound services for our young people and the resources to really support our young people, human resources and the professional development to provide the appropriate resources uh, for those wraparound services for young people who need uh, and deserve those wraparound uh, services. And so those are the areas that I think uh, that, that we, would, uh, we would ask and uh, where the needs really exist uh, there. And I, I don't want us to lose sight with everything else of the competitive compensation and uh, to always keep that before us um, as we move forward as well. Yeah, Dr. Smith, thank you. I was struck uh, earlier in the year by Dr. Smith's analysis of the impact on students of a teacher shortage. And uh, w without validating the number, I heard that there were about 1,200 teacher vacancies when we started That's the school right. year. And I quickly used an assumption of, say, that each of those teachers taught 75 students, fully recognizing that many of our secondary teachers f teach far more than that, and many of our elementary teachers uh, potentially teach less than that. But uh, if you use 75 as a factor for 1,200, then 90,000 of our 1.2 million students in the Commonwealth are potentially impacted by the teacher shortage. And so uh, we know how important this is a, as an issue. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna take the rest of the time and ans ask open-ended questions. So, so certainly not everyone has to answer them, but uh, would, would look for at least one volunteer. Um, we heard a, a great deal earlier in, in our, our Voices from the Field panel, our amazing teachers, about uh, the lack of autonomy that they're feeling the increased workload, the increased stress, uh, the number of mandates that are coming down, sometimes from central office, sometimes from the state. Uh, at, as policymakers and leaders, uh, how are you thinking about that issue and, and uh, what, what steps are we taking uh, to, to, to do less for our teachers as it relates uh, to mandates and the such? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll jump in because this has gotten to be extremely clear. Um, and I think it goes to what is really the problem now in, in the nation when it comes to teaching, and that's the culture. And it's backwards. It is completely backwards. I would never run a business uh, the way we make the education system run. Everything from the beginning, your learning environment. I mean, we change up how, what, what a work environment looks like because you want an environment that allows the people to reach their, their best opportunity and, and to want to come to work in that day. But many of the learning environments that we put you all in isn't what allows you to be the most productive, be the most effective, allow the students to reach their true potential. Why is it that we don't ask, when we look at new schools, we aren't involving more teachers and creating them around environments that allow you to have what you know allows you to want to come to school every day, allows you to be most productive, and honestly, creates an environment that students want to learn in. I've been in alternative learning environments where they had everything from sensory swings to, to desk fans to a number of things, uh, different layouts when it comes to um, work rooms for teachers and collaboration rooms. Why don't we talk about that? We look at, in a business, I hire people smarter than me and I let them do their job. I tell them what they need to do, what I expect, and when they do their job, I stay away, but we don't do that in government. We say, okay, we want you to hire this. I don't know what the heck I'm telling you to do, but I'm gonna tell you how to do it. And then I'm gonna tell you how I'm gonna measure you. Why don't we actually allow teachers to be hired, do their job, and as long as we're getting the results we want from students, leave them alone. And SOL tests, 
Okay, so I do have an attention span about yay big. Um, and uh, so I hate standardized tests. I can't stand them. Uh, we all know that if you take a kid out of certain areas and they don't have breakfast in the morning, a difficult home life, they're gonna perform 15 to 20 points less than what they would have performed on any other given day. Why is it we're not using technology to really allow teachers to monitor the mastery of a subject as opposed to this point in time test? Uh, there was a point and a purpose for SOL tests, but as you've heard up here, it's way out utilized it, its purpose. So I, I think we've got to get around that culture scenario. And the last piece goes back to the compensation piece. Look, I love where things are heading. Dr. Lane, I mean, I, we had that deep learning exercise that you brought to us last week in the SOL innovation. Uh, and it was amazing, but I can tell you the couple of teachers that came in front of us that were talking about this deep learning and how they were gonna bring this, one out of three of them, I guarantee you, will not be a teacher in 10 years because the corporate world will take them away in a heartbeat. What I'm seeing from teachers now, what you're doing, I'm just not seeing how great it is in, in, in the classroom. I'm seeing how great it is in the corporate world, in a boardroom. You know, you're creating a culture, you're, you're doing trainings. That type of stuff is so desired out in the corporate world that if we don't get compensation right, we're not gonna have good teachers and great teachers because the minute they become good or great, they're gonna be hired away. So when we look at what is it that the state needs to do, or what are we doing? We need to recognize that we're starting to produce some of the best out there, but we need them to be mentors for that next generation coming up. And we have to fix all this stuff. So we don't have the answers, but I will tell you the one thing we do have to be careful of, and, and I, I, reckon, I respect Jim's position quite a bit, but we gotta be careful of some of the rhetoric because we all need to come to the table. I don't know the answer to this, but Jim does and all of you do. If we're not trying to balance uh, uh, you know, the, the budget on the backs of the children. I can tell you, I'm sitting up here for one reason, one reason only. My seventh grade social studies teacher, Ms. Milaniano, I hated government. Never understand why people got involved. I have the stick figure still of her Lincoln-Douglas debates, okay? We all want what's best for all children. We have children, but we all need to be able to come together and we can share what the difficulties are that we're facing and, and some of the challenges. You can share the others and we're gonna find a solution because honestly, the future of our Commonwealth and our children depend on it. Thanks, Can I interject just? Um, in, in my career as a teacher, I have been asked to punch a card to show that I've come to work. I have to sign in to a book to say that I have come to work. I have to sign out of a book to say that I have left work. It is the, the idea that we're not per licensed professionals by the state of Virginia. And until we treat an educator like we would te treat any other licensed professional, like a Commonwealth attorney, then we will forever be second class. And until we are treated like professionals, guys, we got to figure this out. You know, I, I guess as a representative of the Board of Ed, we, we bear some blame for our, this. You know, the, the source of regulation in Virginia comes from two places, right? It either comes from the General Assembly or it comes from us. Uh, we have begun asking on everything that is discretionary with us, will this benefit a child in the Commonwealth? That's the question. And if not, frankly, we try to table it. Uh, last year, I believe there were, give or take, 250 bills that came through the legislature dealing with education. And all of them, and I, I'm not, this is not about the legislature because we fall into the same category. Most of them are tinkering around the edges as opposed to dealing with what we now understand to be systemic problems. It would, I think, lessen the load of the teacher in the classroom eventually if both the board and the legislature stopped tinkering around the edges, resisted the temptation to get easy fixes to small problems, and focused just for a little bit on the major systemic problems that we all agree that we have. And if the legislature would do that, we will happily do that also. If um, I could add to that, I also taught before the SOL started in 1998. Um, and uh, I do think we did not do it well back then. Um, and what I would encourage um, our teachers to do is there's always gonna be somebody who's gonna look at an accountability measure that we have to control the conversation and we have to do it very well. Um, if we're going to have control back as we're going to now, um, we know, those of us who have been in this, as soon as some major catastrophe happens, like SAT scores go down two points, 
we know somebody's gonna be clamoring about why we're not teaching enough reading and this reading program needs to be here. I'd also really want to uh, encourage um, you know, our members of the House of Delegate and the Virginia Senate. Um, then when we look at things and you talk about quick fixes, I'm glad you said that. It's not the program, it's the people. And we put, have to invest in the people to make a difference. Because if we have good people, you can throw any program at us and we're gonna make it work, but we've gotta put investments in the people to make it work. And I, and I think, you know, my, my general comment um, in terms of uh, what we have heard, and I would say that we, we know where we need to go, and I think we need to be in control of our own destiny, mm -hmm. and there's no reason why we can't get there um, because we know where we need to go. Thanks, Jim. Jim, I don't want to keep you from answering that question. You were the only one that didn't take a shot at it. So feel well, I, I, you know, I, I do not disagree with anything that uh, any of the other panelists have said. I think it is time for us to come together. I think it's time for everyone to come to the table, and I think it's time for all of us to work together. I absolutely uh, agree with that. And um, President Gecker, I appreciate your analysis because it is spot on. We, we have for too long avoided the central issues that are impacting uh, K-12 education in the Commonwealth for years. And we, we've simply been playing around. Um, and and, and my, um, my comments regarding balancing budgets and so forth should be interpreted as, you know what, it's time for us to get down to the serious business. It, it's time for us to have the serious uh, conversations. You know, one of the things that I, you know, we, we talk about retention, but I, I, I was having a conversation with the secretary during lunch. It's not just a matter of retention. We have to be focusing as well on recruiting. And, and I need to share the story, uh, the story that, uh, story that Ms. Treadway um, shared regarding um, her concern or her refusal actually to encourage her seven-year-old, I think it was, to uh, dream of becoming a teacher one day. I had a conversation with a, a, um, a finance officer who worked in a major bank in Northern Virginia. Uh, it's been two or three years ago. And, and um, his, his observation, and he does counseling, financial counseling for um, student loans. And the story that he shared with me, I think, really sums it up. He counsels young people going to college against going into teaching. He said it's a matter of simple math. To graduate with a fifty to seventy thousand dollars student loan and take a job as a teacher in the Commonwealth of Virginia is like assuming a second mortgage. We have to decide our priorities, and we have to put our money where our mouth is. It's time we pay our teachers. It's time we pay them competitively, regardless of what they teach. And it's time we pay our support personnel a living wage in every area of the country. Thanks, Jim. I I have about 40 more questions that I would love to ask, but <laughs> with the time that we have left, which is about 10 minutes, I do want to make sure we have time for some audience questions. Any questions? Uh, if we could have the microphones down here. First of all, thank you all for uh, the conversation. Uh, it's always good to have that. Uh, the second thing I want to say is, uh, is a personal viewpoint, but one I think that's a, a one of growing, of growing belief in Virginia. It's no longer K through 12; it's pre-K through 12, and we need to get to that because the mind, the brain development, and those very early stages is very, very important, and we're starting to learn that. I, I think the thing that we really need to focus on is to quit asking why and start saying why not, and, and just move on. And that's not a question, that's just a statement, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, for time's sake, because we know folks want to hear from our panelists, please uh, do ask questions uh, as we move forward. Uh, thank you, thank you all for coming today. Uh, as I've said a lot here that benefits were a major uh, attraction to teaching, 
Uh, a few years ago, the General Assembly basically borrowed a bunch of money from the VRS. Uh, during the hard times, uh, the fruition of that money did never get paid back, and it was then balanced on the backs of teachers. How are we going to protect the VRS going into the future from the General Assembly dipping their hands into it in the next financial crisis? How can we set that aside so it's a true lockbox and that money is only guaranteed to be spent on retirement benefits? And, and uh, if, if I could just maybe add a piece to your question, is the General Assembly considering defined benefits as the, the primary focus rather than the hybrid system? Well, look, I'll, I'll, uh, so this is where I need some input from y'all and, and new teachers. Um, so I was uh, tasked, I was on city council for five years in Virginia Beach, and I was tasked to get involved with the uh, defined comp, defined benefit scenario. It happened to be the same year the General Assembly went to the hybrid system. There was a study done, and it showed that the only city workers that, uh, and state workers that went into, a, um, into an industry that expected to retire from that industry anymore were public safety. When a teacher went into teaching, they were not committed that they were going to retire from them. So my biggest issue is I want to have the best and the brightest those that have the passion to teach. But if I say, look, I'm going to give you a, a defined benefit package on the backside in X number of years, if they're not committed that they're going to retire with that or even vest with it, what benefit does not give? But young people want portability. So I'm committed to trying to find some scenario how we balance better pay, starting pay, for the attraction but also not say, look, there's this big golden nugget out here, but we're going to make you stay handcuffed for X number of years. I want to give you that portability with it. And I think we have to have that. We have to realize that my dad, I, so my first job was in sales, commission only. When I got that job, my dad said, Glenn, what are you doing? You start with a company, you start at the bottom, you work your way up, and 25 years later, you retire. And I said, but dad, that's not what I want. Things have changed. This generation's different. We have to adapt to making sure we we provide and follow in on the promises we gave everyone sitting here today, but also more to make sure that we can give what this next generation wants to continue in this profession. And, and I, I didn't mean to steal the question. I, I just mm -hmm. posing it back to the panel. What about the notion of uh, uh, that when to balance budgets in difficult times, sometimes we've had to look at VRS. Is that a, a strategy being considered moving forward? I would be against that. No, I. So I, I remember. I remember when there was a VRS holiday. Um, back when I was on city council, and the city of Virginia Beach said, we don't want a VRS holiday, we want to send our money in, and the state said no. Now, how absurd is that? So I thought that was absurd then, I think stealing from VRS is absurd now, uh, and I hope we would never see that. Amen. Other, other panelists? <laughs> Amen. I'm three years out. Cody? <laughs> so, <clears throat> excuse me, we've, we've heard a bit about you know, I think a lot of us in here have been agreeing about how standardized tests are really causing a lot of issues. And I was wondering if we could just paint a picture um, about how much money we're spending on standardized tests, implementing them, analyzing them. And I also want to compare that to how much money we're putting into uh, mentorship programs and other programs that are research-based and improve retention and learning of students. You know, not having the numbers, I'll, I'll take a crack at this question. The, the, actually, one of the major issues that we're facing at the Department of Education is that uh, as we revise standards, there's not ongoing money to revise the assessments. And so each year we're having to go and ask. So if you're a history teacher, you're well aware you're still delivering the 2008 assessments, mm -hmm. even though we have 2015 standards. And so um, I, whereas there's a, a significant cost to uh, implementing the SOLs, uh, with, I wouldn't want to misquote the number. Uh, but certainly uh, that, that dollar figure uh, pales in comparison to the needs that we have in compensation. Yes. I Other would, questions? I, I, I would venture a guess, I, and, and, and again, this is, this is not an exact figure, but my understanding is that we pay Pearson in the neighborhood of $330 million a year. Yeah. Is that? $38 million? Yeah. But that, that's just to Pearson. Right. Yeah. And we raise the yeah, I, I don't think But when you Jim, factor in all the other components that go along with the testing, the, the price tag goes much higher. <laughs> Again, I, I, I don't want I don't want to misquote those figures. I, the uh, I know it's not three hundred million though. <laughs> Good, thank you. Uh, other questions. Yes, sir. Thirty eight million. 
Hi, my name is Chuck Ronco. I'm a teacher of Prince William County, um, and uh, I also got a sub <laughs> for today. Uh, but luckily, all the kids are taking a test because we need more data. But um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I came, I came because I really had a question um, about teacher retention, and one of them um, specifically is the idea that we have a boatload of new teachers coming in from land grant universities, <laughs> state universities, and we're not talking about tuition reimbursement. We're not talking about loan forgiveness. And I would really, really like to see if there are any ideas on the table for that. Um, because we have a lot, I mean, as tuition keeps climbing and climbing and climbing, really there are only two ways you can get loan forgiveness. One of them is the 10-year plan, which doesn't really make a heck of a lot of sense if you are a career switcher. Um, because, like for myself, I'm going to retire before I pay off my student loans. Um, but then you have the five-year plan from the, from the Department of Ed, which, again, career switchers aren't eligible for because they have loans that are too old. So is there anything, is there any conversation, is there anything going on about trying to help loan forgiveness, especially for the people coming in, but even for the people that are in the program now? Thank you. I mean, there's com yes, there's conversations. Uh, I mean, I, I, I have conversations, you have conversations. Absolutely there needs to be do. more of a formal right. conversation. Um, I think we've reached a point where everything's got to be on the table. We, we know we have a problem, and the status quo isn't solving it. The status quo programs and policies will not solve it. So we need to start looking a little bit more outside the box and say, what can we do? We know that if we want more STEM graduates, you start subsidizing tuition, and you'll get people going into STEM. The same thing with education, so we need to have those conversations. Uh, I know they are, but I think it needs to happen in more of a formal scenario. So I don't think I've seen a piece of legislation on it per se, but I think it's conversations being had. Absolutely. I would agree that conversations are out there. There were some bills introduced. They didn't get far this past, you know, they, everything dies in subcommittee. Um, but, but at least the conversations are being created for the first time. I mean, and, I mean this was my first session. So I don't have a whole lot of history to reflect back on. But I can say this year, there were numerous conversations in regard to um, student debt and tuition reimbursement and all types of different avenues. Okay, we're gonna take one final question. Hi, um, Michelle Cottrell-Williams, uh, Arlington Public Schools. Uh, also took a sub to be here. And um, yeah. the uh, leadership opportunities that I've had uh, the chance to work on over the last year as Virginia Teacher of the Year uh, have been really amazing. Um, but today uh, was, I, I haven't counted it up, but since September 4th, when school started, I've already taken over 10 days off uh, for uh, working on things like this, uh, which is unsustainable for me as a full-time mm -hmm. teacher. Uh, and uh, the data showed us earlier that 17% of teachers leave the profession to go into administration. That is not actually something that I want to do. I don't want to have to leave teaching uh, to take on leadership roles. Uh, and several other states have uh, teacher leadership tracks that exist Amen. where teachers can have Amen. hybrid positions, where they stay in the classroom, but they also have the space uh, in their day uh, to develop leadership. Uh, where is Virginia? kind of looking forward on that. We had that discussion just last week. Um, we did the um, General Assembly Joint House Senate um, Education Summit, and that was one of the key components, was developing kind of a career teacher who then becomes the leader, and they have less classwork, but then they have more leadership. And so that was absolutely part of the summit last year, uh, just last Monday, a week ago Monday. So we, we are looking into that. We were having discussions on it. We heard the data about why this is a good idea. I mean, I can't tell you how many times in more than 25 years I've been asked to go into administration. I have zero interest in administration. I like being in the classroom. And so I never went forward with it. So I get it. I had often wished that there would have been a, a teacher leader in the building or within um, departments, especially at the high school, for, well, for high school for me. Uh, and that's, that's an ongoing conversation that we've been having with our um, public education coalition partners, VAS, um, which is, represents superintendents, principals, uh, and so forth. That, that, that's part of uh, what we're looking at and, and really trying to move forward with regard to um, 
you, you need to have lead teachers in, in building master teachers, if you will, uh, who can serve in the role of, of mentor, uh, teacher mentors. Uh, but they need time off during the day in order to be able to do that, in order to go into a classroom and, and sit and observe, and then to um, be able to debrief with uh, the, the individual that they have been working with and, and so forth. Unfortunately, those things cost money, um, as, as do most of the things, and, and uh, I, I would simply say that it's going to take a great deal of effort from all of us, January 28th being a prime opportunity, um, for us to, to really push some of these issues forward. Um, it, it goes back again, in my mind, Michelle, to priorities. Uh, you know, these are great ideas. We know they work. The research says they work. Other countries are using these ideas and so forth because they're willing to pay for them. It's time we did too. One of the biggest issues that, I, you know, I, I seem to understand, I've heard a lot about, a lot of teachers go into administration because of the pay scenario. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you lose some of your best teachers. And, you know, in the business sector, I can tell you many times I've seen the fallacy of, you take a really good salesperson, you make them a sales manager, but they're not that great of a sales manager. They don't really have the passion for it, but it's the pay scenario. So the question I think we can help solve that is, is like you said, first off, create leadership tracks because the best teachers make great mentors. Secondly, create a track on compensation that our best teachers that are great mentors are being paid like we pay administrative professionals. I think that'll start curbing a little bit of that. Um, unfortunately, Virginia is not in the lead when it comes to that. I think there's a lot of some states that we can take a little bit of a, a, a maybe of a, of a lesson from, um, but we have to start working more down that track because right now compensation is going from teacher to administration. At that point, we lose some of the best inside the classroom. Well, thank you to each of our panel members for such an insightful and candid policy discussion today. <laughs> While our panelists leave the stage, at this time we're going to prepare for our small group policy discussions and our brainstorming sessions. In your small groups, please make a concerted effort to keenly reflect on the day's presentations and panels. Using personal and professional experiences, we hope that your small group will produce several ideas and recommendations on how to mitigate Virginia's teacher retention issues. Please challenge yourself and your group mates to dig deeper and beyond teacher pay as the only solution. Each group will have a facilitator that will guide the group's discussion. Feel free to think creative and outside of the box. We welcome all of your thoughts. On the front of your name tag, you will find a letter A through O. Those letters indicate your room that you occupy for the breakout sessions. Please look to the screen at this time for your breakout sessions room. There will be volunteers to help direct you to your respective meeting locations, and we look forward to